From the Heritage Foundation, I'm Doug Blair, and this is a special episode of Heritage Explains. Over the next few months, I'll be speaking with a number of Heritage's experts about a topic on everyone's minds right now, education. As a former educator, I've seen firsthand the way the left has infected the education system and turned schools into indoctrination centers for their radical ideology. As we begin to send our kids back to school virtually or in person, we are witnessing massive protests and riots in America's largest cities, increased anti-American sentiment, and the canceling of some of the most important people from Western history. Amidst all this chaos comes the question, why is this happening? Why do these people in the streets hate America so much? The answer is they were taught to hate it. 29% of those Americans that were asked could not name the vice president. 73% could not correctly say why we fought the Cold War, which was over communism. And 43% were not able to define what the Bill of Rights are. Who was president during the Great Depression and World War II? Oh, Jesus. I think it was Nixon. Nixon. I want to say Ronald. Eisenhower. Woodrow Wilson. Like an old white guy. This happened in Florida. The student refused to stand for the pledge and told his substitute teacher the flag is racist and he finds the national anthem offensive to black people. I'm ashamed to be an American when not all folks are free. And I won't forget the enslaved who died and built this place for free. So I proudly lift up all the folks who are still oppressed today. Cause there ain't no doubt this ain't our land. Trump and the USA. According to a 2018 survey conducted by the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation, only one in three Americans would pass a citizenship test. 60% of respondents did not know which countries the U.S. fought against in World War II, and 72% of respondents either incorrectly identified or were unsure of which states were part of the 13 original colonies. This week, our guest is Katie Gorka, director of the Fulner Institute's Center for Civil Society and the American Dialogue. We spoke about the failure of American public education to teach civics. Our discussion after this short break. Americans have almost entirely forgotten their history. That's right, and if we want to keep our republic, this needs to change. I'm Jarrett Stepman. And I'm Fred Lucas. We host The Right Side of History, a podcast dedicated to restoring informed patriotism and busting the negative narratives about America's past. Hollywood, the media, and academia have failed a generation. We're here to set the record straight on the ideas and people who've made this country great. Subscribe to The Right Side of History on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, and Stitcher today. Thank you for joining me, Katie. Great to be here. First question I would ask is, What exactly is causing our children to fail so badly at basic civics? What specifically are they being taught that makes them hate America? Oh, my goodness. That's the million-dollar question. Um, Well, I think there are two quite distinct things at play here. One is – no, I'd I'd even have to go to three. Okay, one is we simply don't teach civics the way that we used to teach civics. So there's been an assessment that – what they call our grandmother's civics is no longer working, and therefore we need something that's more, quote, action-oriented. Um, but what what they've in fact learned is that our grandmother's civics were in fact very effective. And so the end result today is a simple decline in civic knowledge. The simple facts, how our government works, people don't know it, kids don't know it anymore. That's one problem. Then a second problem is you have the raft of anti-American content. So, of course, the most famous one is Howard Zinn's uh, uh, People's History of the United States, which is just, you know, with its Marxist identity politics grounding, is just full of anti-American inaccuracies. Um, and and I would say this, the New York Times 1619 project follows in that same path. Um, But the third problem, and this is the really, I think this is the really interesting challenge. The third problem is we really don't talk anymore about 
what it means to be human. You know, what were the ideas? What was the thinking that undergirded the founders' ideas in in creating the republic that they did? You know, in essence, political philosophy. We, we don't. We hardly teach it. I mean, granted, there are a few places that do it and and do it very very well, um, but it's not something that we commonly teach. And I think this is really the deeper problem. So, fixing all three of these is a is a big project. Can you give us a history of public education in America? Why did we even start doing public education in the first place? Was there a justification for it? Uh, yes, actually, there was, and it was really this. Um, Horace Mann, who was a leading advocate of public education in the mid-1800s, um, said that a republic whose citizens were uneducated would be like an insane asylum. Uh, and he believed that public education was essential to cultivating civic virtue in students. You know, that was the founding. And this was a really interesting challenge throughout the 1800s, right? This was something that Lincoln touched on in a speech that he gave in 1838, when he acknowledged the fact that we now faced a unique challenge in this country where we no longer had people that had lived through the revolution were no longer alive, right? So you didn't have that living history or that living memory. So how did you carry on the knowledge that was required for a self-governing republic? And in a way, that's what Horace Mann was responding to, right? We needed to teach it um, since it wasn't there in our cultural life, our daily life, um, for example, by having our grandparents around us who had lived through the revolution. Um, so that was the thinking behind public education. Interesting. It's it's interesting to know that there was a reason for it. So the next question then would be, when did the original ideas of public education that Lincoln espoused shift to the brainwashing and leftist indoctrination we see in public schools today? You know, I'm not an expert on public education, so I'm, I'm sure there are others who would do a better job than me on this. But I, I can say I can say this much because it's it's you know, we talk about it a lot. You know, I think that that really it started to be in about the 70s and the 80s that the, the change started to come about. I mean, I, I was a an elementary school in the 60s and it was it was still pretty straightforward at that point. But already it was changing. I mean, I when I think about my high school in the 70s, it, w- it was already very much changing and, and sort of moving left. But then it really sped up in the, the 80s, the 90s, um, and it just got further and further into trouble. But I would say, you know, even earlier, again, if, if we talk about the importance of understanding the sort of the deeper ideas of what it means to be human. Um, I, I think we lost that earlier. And I think we put we put so much emphasis on education as merely the transferal of information, right? Rather than sort of the deeper notion of of really talking about the, the deeper issues. I, I think that started earlier. So you know, again, you've got these different trends going on. Given all of that, is the public school system even salvageable? There's been increased talk recently of pandemic pods and homeschooling our children. Given that we know that there was an original reason for public education, what is the reason for public schools with these new options on the table? Well, you know, the bottom line is, I I just think you have the reality, public school is not going to go away. 90%, I think, I think that's the right number. 90% of American students are in public schools. You know, we we can push for school choice, we can push for charter schools, homeschooling, education pods, all the different options that are out there. But the bottom line is public school is not going to go away. And I think it would be a real mistake for conservatives to turn their backs on it. And I think in a lot of senses, I think that's why we've gotten into the trouble we are these days, because we conceded education to the left and we kind of took our eyes off of it. I think, though, the seeds of redemption in this picture have already been sown. You know, this is one of the great blessings of this coronavirus, one of the few blessings of the coronavirus crisis, 
is the fact that I think it has woken up many, many people to what's going on in our schools. Um, You're seeing a lot of initiatives now coming about as a result of the failure of schools to step up and, and deliver. Now, to be fair, I, I don't I don't want to really condemn teachers here because I think they're in a very, very difficult situation. Teachers are being asked to do things that they weren't necessarily trained to do, that they weren't prepared to do, that they weren't contracted to do. Um, so they've been put in a difficult position. But at the same time, schools have have really fallen short in a lot of ways. Um, in being able to deliver. And I'll just mention, you know, the school district where where I live, Fairfax County Public Schools, 10th largest school district in the country, $3 billion budget. And even six weeks into the coronavirus shutdown, they could not get online learning working well for people. And so it's interesting. So the response has been some parents have gotten together and they've created an organization called Do Better FCPS, Do Better Fairfax County Public Schools. Their focus is on ensuring that their kids receive decent online education. But what's happening is they're getting into all kinds of other issues as well. They're paying attention to the content that their kids are seeing and they want more. They want more transparency. And this is a movement that we're seeing across the country. Parents are realizing the consequences of the type of content their kids have been receiving. And I think this is also very much a function of the the riots and the violence and the protests that have been going on over the last couple months. I think people are waking up and realizing We can't just turn our backs on the schools and trust that our kids are going to be taught the way we were taught or that it's all being taken care of and that the types of negative content that's being fed to our kids has consequences. The consequence is rioting in the streets, tearing down our statues, and basically tearing down our history. And so the the combination of these two sort of things I think have created a perfect storm where I really believe, and maybe I'm being optimistic, but I really believe we are going to start to see um, a major reform in public education. One can hope. I think it's a really interesting point you bring out about the protests, about how the protesters are destroying symbols of American history, because we can acknowledge that American history always, it's not always rosy, it's its not perfect, but how do we as conservatives address the very real faults that we have in our history, but still recognize the incredibly amazing ideas rooted in the declaration that make America such a great country? Yeah, I think that's a, a terrific question. And in a lot of ways, it should be at the heart of the conversation that we're having as conservatives. And I think that it is it is going on. Um, I think there is a real t- trend now not to just gloss over our history or not to paint it in an unrealistically rosy way, but to really em- embrace our shortcomings, to be very honest about our shortcomings, to look honestly and accurately at the history and move forward from there. And and that's, you know, that's why things like the 1619 Project are so totally destructive because they're trying to create a narrative that America was fundamentally racist, that we are racist in our DNA, and indeed that we are irreparably racist. And I think that's wrong. The founding principles of the United States are are truly the only foundation on which you can build a nation where all people are treated equally under the law. And if we throw out that foundation, we are going to revert to tyranny. But I think on a, I mean, that's so it makes it sound very dire, but in fact, there are many good initiatives. And I'll I'll mention two in particular. So there's been a terrific new textbook uh, issue just in the last couple of months. And it was really written as a response to Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States. And that's Wilfred McClay's 
A Land of Hope. This is a beautiful new textbook about the United States. And it it does not gloss over the bad. It's it's a very honest history, but it's it's ultimately a very beautiful history. And then I would say the same thing can be said of of a great initiative from the Bill of Rights Institute, which is called um, they have just released, I think just actually in July, released a terrific free online curriculum, uh, just a vast treasure trove of content called Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. And one of the things they did there, one, two, two things that they did that I think are so admirable. One is that they too really embraced the fullness of American history, meaning our achievements and our failings, our aspirations and our failure to meet those aspirations or the fact that oftentimes we've been far too slow to achieve those aspirations. And and so they they talk openly about that. But the other thing they do that I think is so interesting is they present the lessons of American history from different perspectives. So it's not all conservative history, right? They have different voices, different views. And and I think that is so important because that's one of the things when, when people talk about the decline in civic culture. I mean, one one of the tremendous sort of failures of our education system today is is its failure to teach children, people, to argue a point of view. And not only to argue a point of view, but to listen to a point of view, another's point of view, and to potentially learn from it and grow. And, and so I think that's something that that as well with the Bill of Rights Institute initiative, I think is is so commendable. Yeah, it's great to hear that there are organizations and there are institutions that are putting out content that recognizes America as a really great country, but then also can acknowledge that we have our fault and that we're always trying to get on the right track. One of the last points I wanted to, to ask you about is in your view, what are some of the absolute essentials we must teach our children if we want to get the country back on track? Wow, that's a really good one. I mean, I, I think it goes without saying that we need the founding documents. I mean, that's the simplest. But I think lately I've become even more persuaded of the importance of sort of the thinking that preceded the founding documents. You know, I came across, so again, there's a there's a terrific new book um, that addresses this called, it's by uh, Robert Riley called America on Trial, A Defense of the Founding. And he has there a great quote um, from John Adams where he says, this was the object of the Declaration of Independence, not to find out new principles or new arguments never before thought of, but rather it was intended to be an expression of the American mind. And what he's getting at there is that Americans, okay, you couldn't call them Americans before that stage, but right, the inhabitants of what became the United States of America had really been grappling with these ideas ever since they landed in this country, since the 1620s, grappling with the ideas of self-government, uh, human nature, natural law, um, the, the, the necessity for consent, uh, the right to revolt if your ruler is unjust. I think we really have to go back to those ideas. And in fact, if you're going to go back to those ideas, you really have to go all the way back to the beginning to to Cicero, to Greek philosophy, Roman law, and then, you know, right up through the centuries. That's what I think we need to restore. And again, I'll say the answer I think is there. I would say this is the aspiration of classical education. Um, This is a tremendous movement that's that's quite robust and healthy in our country. And I think in the long run, this is going to be our salvation. And I just hope that the recognition of the importance of that educational foundation, that it gets picked up more broadly. It, it needs to move beyond um, the classical education schools and needs to move back into the public schools. That's a lot to think about. It's it's very important to focus on our public education and, and make sure that our kids are learning about 
the civics that make this country so great. Thank you so much, Katie, for being here to discuss this very important topic. I really appreciate hearing from you. Thanks for having me, Doug. Thank you for listening to this week's special episode of Heritage Explains. If you liked this episode, please take the time to share it with your friends and family, leave us a comment or rating on your podcast listening app, and send in your thoughts and comments to editor at heritage.org. It really helps us get the word out and build our audience of patriotic Americans. If you want to learn more about the resources and organizations Katie mentioned in this episode, take a look at the show notes to find out more. Thank you again for listening, and I will see you all in the coming weeks. Heritage Explains is brought to you by more than half a million members of the Heritage Foundation. It is produced by Michelle Cordero and Tim Descher, with editing by John Pop.